Broadcasting from the commodity capital of the world, Zurich, Switzerland, this is Insider's Guide to Energy. This addition to Insider's Guide to Energy is brought to you by Fidectus. Go to www.fidectus.com for more information. Welcome to Insider's Guide to Energy. I'm your host, Chris Sass, and with me this week is Johan Oberg and Mark Sello. Welcome to the program, guys. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. For the, great to be here, Chris, and, and great to have Marcelo on as well. Yeah, it is likewise. fantastic to have the crew. We've got, we've got three of us tonight. We've all been on some of the episodes. Um, crazy times in the energy market. It, it's, it's crazy times. It's summertime, so Johan doesn't have to talk about the weather. It's hot here in Zurich and sunny, so we, we can get that one ticked off. Uh, Johan, what are we going to talk about tonight? Well, I think the the interesting thing about this is we talked about, you know, the, the energy transition, people involved in the energy transition. We're talking about the decentralization. We're talking about the, the renewable energies. But there is a glue around this, which is actually the power market and the pricing around this to make sure it all works. And uh, I think that's going to be quite of an interesting uh, discussion today to see what is the future of this? How does this fit together? Are there any challenges and how do they wrestle that in, in, in the coming ones? Because it is an important part of the- And I have to assume those case. are rhetorical questions because I, I see all kinds of problems every day going on in the market uh, around us, right? The, the news isn't particularly good. Uh, energy security seems to be a problem. There's questions about markets and, and things like that. You know, the, the British nickel market didn't really help people feel comfortable with markets in the first place. Now the world's changing, right? So yep. so I, I'm looking forward to having experts. I know last time we had Norpool on, we had an amazing conversation, tons of downloads. So I'm looking forward to tonight's conversation because it, it was a great conversation and I have great expectations tonight. So I turn it back over to you, Johan, to kick us off. All right, but uh, as always, let's bring on the star of the show. Let's bring our guest, and I would like then to welcome Marianne Jensen from uh, Nordpol. Welcome to the uh, show. Thank you so much. Very nice to be here with you today. Uh, it's great to have you on, and as we always start off the show with, uh, is that we know a little bit about you. We have spoken to you before. We knew you coming on the show. We did some prep and some desktop research before the show, but our guests might not know you and might not know uh, Nordpool, which I think most of them do, but maybe a quick introduction. Who is Marianne and uh, who is Nordpool? Let's start with me then. Um, <laughs> I, I am um, I'm a power woman. I am passionate about power markets, how they work and to make them the best if they can be for people, for businesses, uh, for societies, and it's important, like I will come back to later on, uh, to have what we call a transparent um, price made by a market. Now, I am um, the market director of Nordpool. I've been here for good 12 years now, and prior to that, I was in the financial market, um, responsible for financial power exchange, now called Nasdaq. I have been responsible for the growth of Nordpool from you know, being um, a Nordic power market, moving into new areas than today, we operate robust and trusted market in 16 countries. And uh, Nordpool is a physical power market, um, primarily focusing on day ahead and intraday. But we also have a palette of services to make sure that customers can use us as a one-stop shop for their physical power trading. Uh, we have customers in 20 countries now, um, and more than 380 customers trading on Nordpool. We have also, and I'd like to say this because it's important, depending on who's listening to this podcast, extensive services on a consultancy basis. We are servicing and advising governments, TSOs, and um, companies worldwide through our Nordpool consulting entity. Done that for many, many years. 
And we do white label our services so that power exchanges in countries that would like to have direct ownership to their own customers can make use of our operational and technical platforms uh, to service their own group and, and actually run power exchange. We're doing that for IBEX in Bulgaria at the moment and Propex in Croatia. And there will be others to come. So fantastic introduction. It gives me a, a good feel for, for who you are individually and as a company. Um, you heard the little prelude to the show where, where, where we gave just a very brief thought of what's happening in the world. So based on the size and market and where you are, what do you see happening these days? Because you have a pretty good vantage point of what's, what's happening here in Europe, at least. Um, maybe we could start there because it seems to me that we have a little bit of turmoil going on right now. Had you asked a few months ago, I would have said, or, or yeah, months ago, I would have said it's a perfect storm. It's a stormy weather and it's really challenging. Now it is a storm. I just come back from eWorld where I met a lot of different companies, a lot of different partners and customers. And the big topic was what will happen. How are we going to meet this future together? We know that the energy transition has to happen. We all need to roll up our sleeves to make it happen. And how can we all work together to make sure it's um, the smoothest possible journey? We've had uh, an energy price crisis um, from last year, looking at um, challenges with gas storage, um, experiencing uh, low hydro in the Nordics, um, having times of low wind uh, at the same time, really giving a boost to the prices. And we thought that was the peak. And then you all know what happened with the terrible, terrible uh, political situation and Russia with Ukraine. And now um, the gas is really, really the one that's driving it and gas prices. And we all know that with marginal pricing of power, gas is a price setter. So right now, um, this is kind of a, what shall I say, a framework for everything we need to operate within, being um, politically smart, making sure we, we think along the way in terms of how we operate, and making sure we continue to let producers, consumers actually set the price so that we have some steering signals in this storm. And the price is important. The price is um, a very good steering signal for whether it's a shortage of a commodity, power is a commodity, and currently there's shortage. So I guess the, the, the things that come to mind that I've been tracking, right? So gas trading has been way down, right? So if you're an exchange and stuff, I assume that's part of your core business ought to be way off for the moment. Um, I think that most people are optimistic that at some point it comes back. It doesn't go down forever, but for now, until people figure out what's going on, there's been people maybe not trading so much. Um, how is that impacting the decision and what's happening in the market? I mean, I think even at eWorld, you would you know have people tell you that you know gas trading is not, and, and you, you you're in a perfect place to see it is not what perhaps the volumes had been. What what's happening there? In the power market, in the gas market, what's your question? The gas market. Yeah. Well, well, there is less power to be traded, and you know that there is less power coming into Europe. So uh, my side of this is, of course, the effect it has on power prices um, and the fact that uh, with, with um, a scarcity of an important commodity coming in, um, the prices are so high that uh, politicians are interfering with this. You see now temporary um, activities happening from in Spain, where they're actually putting a cap. You see EU having discussions at the moment on power or, or gas caps that will affect um, the input factor to the power. Um, and they're looking to make that throughout the EU. Um, there are so many discussions on, in terms of how to deal with this. Um, and it's coming on top of everything else that is happening where coal is supposed to be reduced, uh, um, uh, nuclear is supposed to be reduced in some countries, in particular Germany. So it's just piles on top of each other, making it a very, very challenging picture to deal with. And if you put a fundamental situation as base, and then you add this ecological situation on top of that, of course, this uncertainty makes people think twice, three times, four times before they act. 
But is that isn't that also a little bit of the the challenge we've seen? We, we, we've had a number of different guests on this show where where it's such a complex ecosystem around decisions uh, for, for this for energy in general. And, and obviously, when you're transforming an industry like this, it becomes even more because it's also something that's crucial for for every being. But would you say, based on 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 a little bit what you mentioned in, in terms of government interference, you know, sometimes that's we can always look at it if it's good or bad. But in in, in the current situation, in terms of the interference that is right now, is that is that hinder um, the, the the market, or is it is it a good thing that the government goes in now and supports? I think it depends. What's your opinion? How, yeah, yeah, my opinion, of course. Uh, now, I think it depends on how they go in and support. And I think um, if the if the if the interference um, is at the level that actually hinders a public price to be formed by buyers and sellers you are actually also hindering investment signals which are absolutely necessary for investors to invest in green shift in yeah. renewable and we must have renewable power into this but you can also do it more on the consumer side which is an opportunity um, in terms like for instance an example is uh, norway and sweden where there is a there is the price cap but the government takes some of the burden of a price above a certain level um subsidizing for a period of time that means you still have a market-based pricing everyone knows what the price is but then it's a substitute um only when the price is above a certain certain level and i think that's more of a temporary solution yeah but i can understand Understand the need to interfere. I can understand the, the, the situation where your input factor is gas. Uh, here in Norway, it's a completely different situation with hydro. So, so, mm. so you know, there is no, um, there is no only one solution to this. Um, but the fact that the EU is trying to put that things, um, put, put at everything together in 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 a holistic way, yeah. might help. But isn't that, I think, the, the, I, I'm, my personal opinion as well, I think this is quite interesting because in, in many ways is the, the whole transition in to, to renewables, to sustainable energy is, is also driven a lot by, by regulatory and, and subsidies from, from, from the government. So it's a, it's a positive in one way, but I guess when we have a number of different initiatives uh, across, if we take Europe as an example, uh, they're not always aligned. So, so for example, if you look at the, the one you mentioned from Sweden and the subsidies, obviously the, the high consumers of energy are the ones who've got a lot of the subsidies as a consumer. And who are the high consumers? Well, the ones who has the big houses, where probably then this is not the biggest cost. So yes, it was a political decision, but did it actually help for the energy transition, especially on this one? Or should that money been spent somewhere else? So I think that's we can always yeah, yeah. juggle that around a little bit. I absolutely agree, Vina, and I think that, that it might not benefit those that need it the most. So there you need to do it through um, housing support or any other way. Um, and and it is a crisis for many people with the energy bills that they see right now. And and, and we have to 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 help out in it from a social um, standpoint. So so there is, I, uh, you know, if those who have the right answer. I think I'd like to 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 go back to the fact that we need to be able to to show what's available and what's on demand i think it's important that even for demand side flexibility and energy efficiency to actually have incentives to reduce um the the, the demand side in this transition is mm -hmm. also a core important factor and if you don't have a price if if even households don't understand what it costs to turn on the shower I was looking at my app the other day for electricity and it said it costs you um, 11 kroner, so approximately one euro to take a shower in 10 minutes. If you manage to do your shower in two minutes, you know, <laughs> you save a lot of money. And it just popped up in front of me. These type of topics have not come to my attention, at least, um, until just recently. 
And I was also reading a very interesting article about what is actually the opportunity, even if we go through significant electrification in transport sectors and other sectors to reduce electricity consumption in households, in buildings, uh, in other ways, it's substantial and significant. If you don't have a price to actually steer against, that will not happen, at least not as fast. Yeah, uh, I think Marcella has a question. Yeah, on the question of the complex times that we're seeing in the power prices here in Europe, do you think, aside of the political situation in Ukraine and Russia, um, do you think that uh, as we traverse to the energy transition, the further along we get there, are we going to keep seeing these um, levels of complexity? As I said, uh, uh, as we transition, is it going to be more complex? Are power prices going to be more volatile? Or is this just the effect of sort of the EU and Europe in general kicking uh, the transition into second gear? Is this a period of adapting to... Uh, no power sources or increasing their penetration that is being very turmoily in a way uh, or will this, will we see this uh, level of volatility continue um, as penetration of renewables just get higher? Yeah, no, uh, my personal opinion is that we will see um, continuous volatility and um, I think the nature of intermittent um, production is exactly that. And from a market perspective, in Norpo has been developing power markets for 30 years, and we have needed to adapt it to new geographies, new ways of working. When I started, we had uh, the power market was 70% about people, you know, 30% about technology. Now I think it's about 90% technology and 10% and, uh, people. People are still important, but the technology rules. With intermittents, um, there is a need to uh, do more automated trading. Um, there is a need to change the market design with inclusion of 15-minute products. This is happening as we speak. Germany already has, in, in also the day ahead spot market, we will have include 15-minute product. It's a must if you, have, if you are a renewable producer. Um, intraday will be traded much, much faster with 15 minutes. You know, hands will struggle. You need robots or automated trading to do it, AI. So there's huge changes that will happen. And of course, this will also um, influence volatility. And then you have the other side, you know, um, how will battery play a role? Batteries. From our side, you know, the battery would be a, a type of uh, producer and consumer in a way, right? Um, how will um, the local markets be able to pick up peaks and actually shave away the peaks because you actually make um, local um, peak loads or requirements uh, visible and transparent again? We have in Nordpol, um, together with Agit Renagi, we were founding fathers of a local uh, market setup which is in its, um, you know, piloting at the moment in many different countries where you made visible what kind of flexibility was present in a local area and how could you actually use that to avoid investments in uh, transformers, in grid, and that business case is enormous. So we'll see a huge amount of innovation, pioneering work, transition, to actually get to 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 um, to the future. So it's and reassuring to hear what you say because it's consistent with a lot of folks in the industry, right? So we are talking about that the transition coming down, um, even if you everything from the substation on down. You know, how do I do more with the infrastructure? Because if if we truly electrified everything, we don't have the capacity, perhaps. And you you need to do these things not even for for shaving, uh, you know, your your bills, but also just to to get the scale of what we need to do. I guess going back to the premise you kind of opened up with, with the unusual times that we're in, is one of the things that that seems to be apparent is that, that you know, there was the very beginning of this political kind of issue. Everyone said, well, energy security is really important and it's going to drive the renewables. But perhaps what you're seeing is coal and you're seeing um, nuclear and others and, and folks are taking a, a road that is maybe slowing down. And I think you alluded to this, to the renewables. Um, whether it's because of the investment you described is saying, hey, if the market's not you know, transparent, you know, maybe the signals to put more investment around out there. 
So are you seeing this? I mean, from, from the conversation points, I'm certainly hearing this saying, hey, this may not be great for the renewables. In the beginning, everyone was like, rah, rah, this is going to accelerate energy security. But now it, it seems like there's more coal getting mined and, and things like that and more of the hydrocarbons being used because that's what people have. Is that truthful or is that just kind of conversation at the water cooler? No, I mean, we, we, we see Germany now talking about the coal side again. We see um, lots of discussions about nuclear. Um, but there, on the nuclear, I think it's, it's a political situation that varies between countries. So, you know, we, we right now there is a, a challenge uh, and delays with the Finnish nuclear coming on stream. There is, um, you know, also uh, maintenance in, in France on nuclear. But I absolutely see um, that many countries will continue to provide nuclear to the market as, as based on electricity. When it comes to coal, um, CO2 will have a price and that's a political tool. And with more coal, there will be even higher price for CO2 because it will be scarcity because they pollute, the coal pollutes. So that means high prices again might actually give investments incentives to the renewable side, we hope so. Um, but I can definitely see that some get tempted to, to re revitalize um, old coal power stations that could still be made to life um, for the moment. And I think we will see it happen. But what I, what I just heard was a very free market um, thought that if that happens and CO2 prices are traded and they go up in a, high enough, that, that the, the economics will incent going back to the energy transition and, and focusing on that once once the prices get to a high enough point is what I think I took away from some of what you were saying. I hope I hope not. I think we have to roll up our sleeves there. I think everyone needs to contribute. And I think we need to, to sit through a period of high and volatile prices and actually take that on the way and find solutions that, that don't interfere with the big job we have to do, which is the energy transition to actually save the planet. Um, so, Marianne, I wonder what is the specific role of Nord Pool and the energy transition? Is it through enabling some of the uh, volatility reducing uh, solutions that you mentioned, like that 15 minute uh, settlement period, uh, AI uh, power trading? Is it through enabling of those or is there anything else? How do you see uh, Nord Pool contributing and rolling uh, your sleeves up? Well, first of all, the most important product we produce is the price, right? A transparent price coming from the market itself, not being set by anyone. It's, it's the market-based price. And to be able to deliver a trusted and robust sort of market and a trusted price, we have to uh, facilitate for new ways of trading. Um, we have to and want to facilitate for all the renewable that's coming into the market with new products. We definitely see our intraday market uh, rapidly growing and it, that will continue. Um, intraday is a continuous market where energy is bought and sold continuously uh, throughout Europe. We also see that uh, there is a need to trade green certificates. And um, I'd love to just tell you about the, a, a pilot we're doing um, together with a very innovative, interesting company called Granular, where we uh, see how we can offer hourly green certificates as tradable instruments. Today, PPAs and green certificates, they're traded long term, monthly, annual, but they don't really reflect the way power is actually traded. So we want to make the, the certificate trading more granular, more linked to the, the way power is trading. And, you know, along the way, starting with hourly, along the way also down to 15 minutes so we can actually follow the power. So that's one way where we innovate and, and, and try new new ways of working. And I think the Nord Pool way is in collaboration with customers. We, we are close enough to the market so that we understand um, what the customer's strategy, producers and consumer strategies are all about, what tools they need, we can't fix everything, but the best we can do is to make sure that they continue to bid and, and trade in an open and transparent marketplace. It's also trusted because we have market surveillance. So 
um, everything that's happening on the platform is, is overlooked by, by a some, you know, very competent market surveillance staff that creates further trust. So you've been a leading player in the since the 90s around this, as you described, you, you, you're expanding into to new markets, you're continually adding new products for, for the actors on the energy market. Uh, and as you describe now, you, you're part of a lot of interesting initiatives, uh, especially for the energy transition. Uh, but as in everything, it's not all roses in, in, in the future. So in this energy transition for a player like you, what, what, what do you see as the kind of the main challenges, for, for maybe for the market, but we discussed that a little bit short term and midterm, but maybe for North Pole, what, what do you see as, as your role and what are the challenges for for you in the in this energy transition well i think that the 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 weight between regulation and 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 you know the the the, the level playing field of regula regulation is a challenge i know we have been a challenger growing into for instance central europe in many countries there and we see that as a challenger, you need to turn every stone, you need to read legal wording, you need to make sure you get the same uh, level playing field as, as incumbents have. So that's, that's hard work in a way, but it's the same, I believe, for, for all challengers when you, when you expand. I think it's um, in terms of this, um, the way markets are developed and security of supply tempts um, a focus further on more system needs than market needs. The current market is built on the needs of producers and consumers to contribute, set the price. Um, I do see and I do worry somewhat about the focus on uh, the TSOs and the power system needs more. Um, the fact that there is so much need to build further um, cables and, and, and power lines um, and it's lagging behind so that that's going to be the showstopper and, and takes us backwards, um, you know, not into the future the way we would like to see. Um, I also worry about this non-customer centric approach. I think customers now, both buyers and sellers and traders are used to being seen, heard, uh, worked with being able to have a voice into the market developments. Um, if this is going the opposite direction, that's not good either, because then you start having more bilateral discussions and more bilateral trading. That's not the way forward, I believe. And I also see that in particular in, in uh, Northern um, or in the Nordics right now, financial power markets are lacking liquidity. That's also a challenge because everyone needs hedging and uh, big discussions in the Nordic right now is how can we, uh, or at least in Norway, is how can we, with the current price regime, uh, enable more uh, fixed price solutions um, to end, end users and end consumers, the way they fix their interest rates and um, anything else. So there's lots of worries out here. Any kind of market intervention is a worry. Um, that it, it, it's going the wrong direction. We believe that the market will do the job if we let it, and then we can have adjustments along the way, of course, and political interference that makes sense at the time, but only temporary. So you alluded to um, that there's more and more bilateral. I'm assuming, is there a spot in your future world um, for OTC, or does OTC eventually wean down to everything being market traded at some point? <laughs> I think it quite different country by country. If you look at the Nordics market, um, there's not that much OTC happening, but you do have some long-term PPAs because the financial market is not covering um, that time frame. Um, but uh, there is a very high market share, uh, above 90% um, traded in the fiscal market. If you go to Germany, if you go to France, um, you have a habit of more OTC trading. I think it's a combination of relationship, um, the price of OTC contract, price of having to post collateral, because collateral is another concern these days with the high power prices. Um, and that tempts uh, players to, to do a bit of both. Um, and it all depends on, on how margining and collateral is, is handled in the OTC world. And I can that, think that's quite different. Uh, it's not one fits all. Uh, on the power exchange is very standard. Uh, and you definitely need to post security for what you trade for. And that is at the moment quite costly. So, so you've, 
you're not painting a super rosy picture of where we are right now. I think you're painting a realistic picture of, of the markets today. Um, are there strategies or things that you would recommend so folks listening that are in positions to take advantage of the market and things like that? What kind of strategies can companies be considering or would you think they should be considering to deal with the things we're talking about? Well, I don't stop investing in renewables. We need we need intermittent production. We need wind and solar and uh, to, to be able to carry us into a uh, electrified future. That's one thing. Keep keep working on and keep doing it. Keep contributing to an open and transparent market. Everyone needs it. We need to know what the price of power is. It's a scarcity good and every good needs a price. Um, I also say let's cooperate. Let's see there are so many different stakeholders in this ecosystem and it's not huge. It is possible to cooperate and have good debates and actually move forward together. Um, yeah, and I think I'll leave it with that. Marianne, um, I want to go back to something that you said a couple minutes ago, which I personally think is very interesting. <laughs> um, the idea of trading certificates in an hourly basis, as opposed to the standard that is now, that's typically a year. Um, what do you think it, it does for... Uh, power markets and energy transition to have that option and that granularity? I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear your uh, take on it. Why is it important to uh, go from a year and a month to an hour of uh, green power trading, if, if you want to call it that? Well, w w the driving factor is to really mirror how power is traded and to make it real, not greenwashing. You know, if, if you are buying a year worth of certificates, but you know that the production has actually gone up and down every day, every hour, uh, every week, um, it's not the real thing. And, 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 and I think that's, that's really a, a, an important driver. Um, the other thing is it, it's more tradable, so you can actually hook it. Um, it, it. It can be linked to the power itself and you can have a marketplace for green power only if you do it that way. So, and then if you have a marketplace, you can actually um, train your robots to understand how to trade it as well. So it's much faster and better. So there are many, many advantages to this. Um, the big advantage about having it on the marketplace again is the fact that it's transparent and everyone knows what the price is. PPAs today are not transparent. And the green certificates uh, are also traded partly on, 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 you know, MTFs and open platforms, but um, only partly. So do you guys then consider in behind the meter power and some of these other aggregators or virtual power pants? How, how much is that playing into where you're at today or how much is that's a little bit of a future? Um, we are B2B and, and we are um, concerned about those that have something to offer in the open market right now. Um, we know that there are many discussions going on as to taxing and, and you know what, what to pay for in terms of uh, you know putting it on the grid, not on the grid, keeping it behind the meter, so on. Um, it's not something that we are that um, concerned about right now in terms of Nord Pool. Um, I also think that if you want consumers to invest in their own um, power plants, uh, whether it's on the roof or on their property. They need some incentives to do so. So uh, maybe look at the big aspects first and then go to the smaller aspects later. One thing, we had some guests on the show previously. We talked about investments. Now coming back to your, your thing about transparency, but tying that to investments. Because as, as we look at it today, uh, is there any way, because they're incentivized from governments, that there are a lot of investments, uh, is there any way to to look at almost the transparency also on the investment with sustainability versus uh, oil, gas, and coal, for example. Because uh, what we're seeing, according to one of our old, uh, one of our guests here before, the investment rate uh, for, for traditional or for, 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 for oil, oil, coal, and gas is still uh, by far today bigger than the renewable part. But now so, you're talking uh, the world, right? Yes, the yes. world. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, but if we go into Europe, I don't know the, the, the actual breakdown numbers in Europe based on our guests, uh, but, but in general, especially also from some of the large oil and gas companies. Uh, how, how do you see this? In order for, we talk about transparency and price is one important part, but on the other hand, we're talking about the investment to actually get this going. We say keep investing, but if we're investing in, in a sinking ship and all the, the main investment goes somewhere else, then so is an oil company a sinking ship is a big question. An oil and gas company in a sinking ship, or is it not? Or are there ways well, to use the profits from oil, you know, for the current production of oil and gas to actually invest in renewables? I think governments have the ability to do to tax and make sure they steer the money where it should be. And then I'm back to all of us rolling up our sleeves together and yeah. getting this economy where it needs to be. But do you see that happening now? Do you see it? Or is it still... Uh, uh, no, I, I wouldn't say investment of, greenwashing in terms of uh, renewables. Yeah, I, I see a lot of questions about it and a lot of discussions about it. Hmm. I don't, but, but, but I might not see the whole picture. So, so you know, but, but I don't see that um, money from grey necessarily flows to the green. Hmm. And I see that investors are short-sighted. They want money now rather than later. So there's only... Um, the only way is through, I think, steering and taxes and, 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 and regulation to actually get the money where they need to be. And that's back to the politicians and how they allocate. I, I believe that we need to, um, to, to, to take money and allocate money in a way um, that facilitates for complete green shift. Which, which brings us back a little bit to the complexity of the entire industry, because we're talking about a free market and we're talking about no regulations. And then we're saying regulation needs to be there in order to drive the transformation. Uh, so we, I guess that's a discussion all on its own. Uh, in, in, there are some uh, dilemmas here. <laughs> for sure. There are uh, some dilemmas, dilemmas, even between this kind of the control driven contra the free market driven. Yes, they will, they will all, and I think these dilemmas will continue to find a balancing act in the whole picture. Yeah. So, Chris? so you mentioned that you're in a number of markets. So, and you talked a little bit about your local market being different. So are any of the European markets more healthy right now than the others or is everybody pretty suffering right now? I think everyone is suffering. And but but maybe for different reasons. I think um, markets that are lacking gas are suffering um, because their whole industry is dependent on it. Um, in the Nordics market, we also have lack of hydro. It's a dry year. It's 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 challenging from that point of view. The discussion we're having in Norway is why do we need to export all our hydropower to countries um, so that they get the green and 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 we have high prices, right? So, so, so it creates so many discussions on this. Um, I, I think that um, the, 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 how shall I put this? Uh, I, I think we need to share the asset. I think Europe needs to share to be able to, to get through this situation. And if we don't manage to do that, um, we will all be troubled. And, so I uh, smile because we just went through COVID and we saw how well sharing and playing nicely worked for, for the global of the globe, right? So sorry, I don't mean to laugh or smile, oh, but I, not in our DNA, I didn't even right? see, like when, when something is scarce, we, we 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 capture what we need to share. We we have developed, you know, the Nordic mar market model uh, has been developed. Uh, it's been adopted throughout Europe. It's been working for a long time, and if we can develop it further in incremental developments rather than, than, than interfere with um, making less um, power flow into the price formation and less demand you know, bidding into the price formation, then we're really taking ourselves years, years back in time. And I don't think it's good for the future. So I think, uh coming up a little bit to the hours, but it, enough of the doom and gloom. So for Nordpool and going back on, on a high note, so, so we, we're looking at this unprecedented situation that we've been in now, and especially our ride up into. Uh, you came back from, from eWorld. I know Chris was there as well, which is a big, big part of, of the, at least the European 
energy uh, community comes together. Uh, any any kind of um, positive things? What was the the, the kind of the, the the sunshine stories that was discussed at at eWorld? Was, was there any positives to pull out of this kind of situation that we're in? Uh, yeah, I think that that it was positive that um, every entity I spoke to, and that were money, they are willing to to work together to actually solve um, the bigger challenge that we all have. Um, they're looking for help and direction. They're worried about their assets. You know, is gas assets going to have a value if there's no gas coming into the system? So they're looking for solutions. And I think we just have to, to, to know that things aren't made in a sort of turnkey. We need to we need to find solutions and that means discussing meetings understanding each other and pulling in the same direction uh, so i think that's very positive actually everyone is concerned about working together to actually get to the other side but when that is and what that is a big question mark but would you say that uh, out of your your experience of course being in the industry for a long period of time understanding this quite well and, and being also in the center of, of this and, and would you say that we are in a position that where the situation that we're in now we might have a little bit of a dent on the energy transition towards this more sustainable or to a green or is it actually in, in progress actually to do this or worst case scenario are we then pulling this back as we discussed previously and saying you know what I, I will increase we're going to i would say all of the above i would say there's good willingness yeah. to move on i say that there's worries and and challenges right now that makes people stop and think and you know try to cope how can we do it in better ways now with with the situation we're in but if you look back it's only 2020 will have the lowest price ever uh, in, 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 in for power, power. 2020 was the lowest, nobody could even imagine the situation we're in right now. And maybe one year from now, things have changed. We don't know, but we need to prepare for the worst and we need to prepare for scarcity. And we need to prepare, you was reading, yeah, I was reading just yesterday or was it today even that um, EU is going out asking for, for um, uh, you know, to reduce demand. Every single citizen, how can you please reduce demand? We need to do it, all of us, and, 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 and kind of everyone pulls in the same direction. But I would say all of the above to your questions. I think, yeah. yes, it's a special situation. Yes, we've been in special situations several times before. Is this extra special? Probably. Yeah. Probably, because we haven't seen it before, right? Just markets and uh, the energy uh, world um, usually sort itself out. Yes, independence of Russian power, new renewable. We just need to stick to what we know is right, and we need more investments. Marcelo, do you have any final questions as we're coming up to time? Any thoughts that you want to ask about? No, I think it's pretty clear. I've asked uh, all the questions on the energy transition side that I had. Did you get answered? Um, did you were you happy with the answers? Oh, definitely, definitely. I agree with uh, some of the points you have there, and it's yeah, it's about uh, you know everyone from uh, the big corporation to the small guy. Uh, you have to roll up your sleeves if uh, we are gonna actually make this transition anytime soon. Well, from, from my point of view, it's been an interesting conversation. It may have been a little bit of doom and gloom, but I think it's the elephant in the room that, that everybody's talking about. You know, we were at eWorld, people are talking about it. I think, you know, energy, politics, and economy all go together. And unfortunately, there's there's some bumps in the road before it gets better from, from where I sit. Um, you know, for individuals in the industry, I think, you know, people as we started the call before we started recording the show today, I said, you know, there's always interesting times in energy. It's always, it's always challenging. There's always a new time that's going to be the worst time that we've ever experienced. And we're in one of those interesting times. And, and as you alluded to in your answer just a moment ago, is generally we work something out and come out the other side. It's just, we don't know what we're going to work out yet. And so um, I appreciate you coming on and, and, and sharing a little bit about what Nordpool is doing and, and especially your firsthand kind of experience of conversations coming back from 
eWorld and meeting with so many of your customers and, and industry perspectives. Um, any closing thoughts before we wrap up that you wanted to share with our audience? From my side, um, keep a good spirit, keep up the good work. Um, the fight to mitigate climate change is our fight, all of us. Um, and everyone needs to do what they can do to contribute to this. Nordpool will continue to um, aid the green shift. We will continue to pioneer power markets and make sure that the markets are simple and efficient and secure to trade in. So everyone um, who either is a producer or a consumer or even a trader, make sure you also use the power markets going forward. That's important. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being a guest on the show today. Um, for our audience, this has been another episode of Insider's Guide to Energy. We hope you've enjoyed the content. We hope it's timely and it gives you a little bit more insight on what's happening in the market today. Um, if you're listening to this uh, in real time, uh, make sure you check out our Next Generation of Energy Leaders podcast. The mini series starts this week. It's going to be out in the next couple of weeks. It's an opportunity to hear what the future leaders in energy are thinking and what they're doing to make the transformation a reality. So we hope you enjoy that as well. And as always, don't forget to comment. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends about us. We'll talk to you again next week. Bye-bye.